So for an average human, an average adult, we have about five liters of blood throughout our body, um, just continuously in circulation. And we like to refer to blood in terms of where it's at in, in circulation. Is it blood that's leaving the heart or is it blood that's coming into the heart? We'll be using um, the words arterial and venous to describe those two different categories. And uh, regardless of where the blood is at, regardless of whether it's arterial or venous, if we were to take a sample of blood and spin it down in a centrifuge, what we would see are these three distinct layers that would end up separating from each other after centrifuging. And so what we have here, um, we have the red blood cells that end up packed closer to the bottom and then floating on top of that, we have kind of a clearish yellow substance. That's the blood plasma. This is in large part just water. Um, and then at the interface between the two, we have this sort of white, it's called a buffy coat. It's a very thin white layer. That's where the white blood cells are hanging out. So if we look at a sample of blood in the microscope, we will see different types of blood cells. We'll see red blood cells, white blood cells, um, platelets as well. We'll be going into each of these in more detail. I'm just breaking it down by composition blood um, in terms of percent volume blood is 55% plasma so again this stuff up here 55% plasma and then 45% what we call formed elements and this just includes cells and things that are derived from cells what is that talking about platelets platelets are derived from other cells so 45% of the blood by volume consists of the th these things right here, things we could see with a microscope. Let's start with the plasma. So blood plasma, again, this is the fluid portion of the blood. This is mostly just water, but it also con contains dissolved substances, di dissolved solutes, things that we get from, um, from the digestion of food, things that are absorbed through, through the intestinal tract. Um, and then also plasma proteins, and we're going to be focused on plasma proteins in this chapter, a couple of them in particular. What do we mean by plasma proteins? Literally, these are just proteins that happen to be suspended in the plasma, and they're always circulating throughout the body. A few really important ones, let me just show you a few of them. What is albumin? Albumin is a protein that helps um, maintain osmotic pressure, so it helps to draw water um, <clears throat> into the blood from the tissues and um, so it helps to maintain the the proper water balance in the blood we also have proteins called globulins and there are uh, several different categories of globulins alpha and beta globulins these are very important for transporting lipids and things that are fat soluble um, throughout the blood and then gamma globulins, we'll be coming back to these in quite a bit of detail when we talk about immunity. Gamma globulins are antibodies, so they help our bodies to fight off infections. And then finally, fibrinogen. This is where our focus is going to be for this chapter. Fibrinogen is a protein that enables clotting to happen. So if there's damage to a blood vessel, um, how do we stop the blood from just leaving the body? We do it through clotting. Fibrinogen is one of the things that allows that to happen. Let's move on to the formed elements. So again, blood is 55% plasma, it's 45% formed elements. So formed elements, we've got three different types of formed elements. Um, and this is just referring to the cells, the different types of cells that are present in the blood. Erythrocytes, number one, these are the red blood cells. Erythrocytes, that's the formal name for red blood cells. And um, they look like this, okay, pretty familiar. We also have white blood cells, formerly called leukocytes. There are many different types of leukocytes. They come in a lot of different varieties. Uh, we'll come back to this in just a minute. I have a separate slide for those. And then finally, those platelets. Platelets are very important in clotting. Uh, the formal name for platelets would be thrombocytes. So three different types of formed elements in the blood. Let's take a look at each of these individually. Starting with erythrocytes, ugh, the red blood cells, erythrocytes. Erythrocytes have this very characteristic sort of concave appearance. They're concave on both sides. And it turns out there's a reason for that. That concave surface on both sides, that helps to maximize the surface area on, um, upon which 
oxygen can be carried. So the big job of these cells, the erythrocytes, their whole job is to carry oxygen. We have a lot of them in order to carry enough oxygen to all the tissues of the body. Uh, this is a very high concentration, 5 million of these cells per millimeter cubed. That's a very tiny volume and that's a huge number of cells. So this is by, by far um, the most common cell to encounter if we were to survey inside of the blood. So red blood cells, we've got a lot of them. Each one contains a huge number of hemoglobin molecules. And hemoglobin is what latches on to oxygen, is what oxygen can bind to and be carried throughout the body. Each hemoglobin can carry four oxygens. And so this, uh, if you do the math, this adds up to a huge amount of oxygen uh, molecules being carried throughout the body. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things about erythrocytes is that they do not have a nucleus. They also do not have mitochondria. So that's kind of strange, and this is one thing that puts a limit on the lifespan of a red blood cell. So red blood cells, once they are produced, um, they generally stay in circulation for about four months, about 120 days, and then they get recycled. They get uh, broken down, recycled by the spleen and the liver, or what helped to do that. Um, but they, keep in mind, okay, they can't just go on indefinitely. They don't have the, the materials that they need. They don't have a nucleus, so they're not able to sort of maintain themselves long term. So about a four month lifespan. The iron, um, when a red blood cell is being broken down, the iron that's in the red blood cell gets recycled. It gets recycled by the liver and the spleen. It's carried through the blood. There's a molecule that grabs onto it, transferrin, grabs onto the iron, carries it um, via the bloodstream, carries it to the red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is where these cells are originally produced. So that iron gets recycled, carried back to the red bone marrow, and then it'll get built back into a new red blood cell that's being formed there. Anemia, this is a condition that results from abnormally low um, amounts of red blood cells, or it can just be due to not having enough hemoglobin in those red blood cells. In any case, anemia, if a person has anemia, this means that their tissues are not getting the optimal amount of oxygen. They're not getting quite enough oxygen. There can be several different causes of anemia. One of them, probably the simplest, is just if a person doesn't have enough iron in their diet. Iron is one of the ingredients for making these hemoglobin molecules. Um, so if we don't have enough iron in the, our diet, then we may end up with um, anemia as a result. Okay, second type of cell, uh, let's take a look at the leukocytes, so the white blood cells. All right, we don't have as many of these. We don't need as many of these in circulation. Let's just compare. So red blood cells, we said there are five million per millimeter of blood, per millimeter cubed. Uh, so 5 million compared to about 5,000 for the white blood cells, so not nearly as many. And this is why, let me just scroll back real quick to the hematocrit. So when we centrifuge blood, uh, what we see is we've got a big thick layer of red blood cells. We have just a tiny little layer of white blood cells. Okay, so there are not very many. Um, uh, we've got just enough to do what they need to do. So uh, the white blood cells about 5,000 on the lower end per millimeter cubed. These are cells that do have nuclei and they do have mit mitochondria as well. Looking at the nucleus of a leukocyte can be very informative. It can help us to figure out which type of leukocyte we're dealing with. So white blood cells, again, they come in many varieties. Um, here are five pictured here on the screen. And you can see there's quite a bit of variety with the shape of the nucleus. These lymphocytes have just kind of a nice roundish um, nucleus. But if we look at an eosinophil, for example, its nucleus is sort of stretched out into two lobes inside of the cell. So a lot of diversity in terms of what the nucleus looks, at, looks like in lymphocytes. Um, these cells move, okay, so they are in circulation through the bloodstream, but they are also capable of just crawling on their own. They move in an amoeboid fashion, which means they form pseudopodia. Um, they reform their cytoskeleton internally, which helps them to push out in one direction and sort of flow in one direction. Um, some of these cells can actually leave the bloodstream. They can crawl through the capillary walls. They can squeeze through, squeeze out the walls. 
um, into surrounding tissues and this is how they go out and deal with infections. We'll be coming back to that in quite a bit more detail when we talk about the immune system. Types of leukocytes. For now, just know that there are two major types, um, granular and agranular. So the granular leukocytes, what this is referring to is the fact that if you look closely in these pictures, okay, some of these cells look granular. They have these granules inside, um, gives them this grainy appearance, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. These are all granular leukocytes. What are those granules? So those are granules consisting of, or sort of like packets of enzymes um, that can, can be released in certain conditions. So for example, if there's a, a foreign invader cell in the body, um, how do we how do we get rid of it? How do we kill it? Well, it's the leukocytes that have that job and one of the things that they can do is go over and dump digestive enzymes onto this foreign cell and kill it that way. So these granules are an important ingredient. They're what allow some of these leukocytes to do uh, that important job of killing off foreign invaders in the body. The agranular leukocytes, just two of them, the lymphocytes and the monocytes. All right, our third type of formed element in the blood. Okay, so recap again, we're talking about what's in blood. We've got plasma, we've got formed elements. In the formed elements, we've got red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Here we are with platelets. All right, so the thrombocytes, these are the smallest type of formed element in the blood. They're very small. And part of the reason for that is they're actually just fragments of other cells. Um, so in the, in the red bone marrow is where cells of the blood are initially produced. And one of those cells in the bone marrow is called a megokaryocyte. It turns out megokaryocytes fragment, megakaryocytes fragment into pieces, and those pieces are what end up being platelets, which are in circulation through the blood. Platelets are very small. Here's kind of what they look like if we were to magnify them in great detail. Uh, platelets do not have nuclei. Again, they're just cell fragments. They lack nuclei. Um, they're very short-lived. They don't stick around for very long. We do have quite a few of them um, just on hand in case injury happens. If an injury happens to a blood vessel, then the platelets are one of the key things that's going to initiate the repair process. Okay, so the way that they do that is by working together with several other things. We mentioned fibrinogen earlier. Fibrinogen was one of the proteins that's just present in blood. It's present in circulation um, ordinarily. Okay, so platelets have a role along with fibrinogen to allow clotting to happen. Platelets can release serotonin. We've met serotonin before. This was um, something we saw when we were talking about the, the nervous system. Okay, so it was a neurotransmitter. Um, but it's also important in um, the circulatory system. Serotonin is something that causes vasoconstriction. And that makes sense, right? If you think about what platelets are doing. So if there's injury to a blood vessel, uh, platelets are going to help help have clotting take place, but they're also going to restrict blood flow to the region just by secreting this chemical serotonin. Um, so the blood vessels will constrict and that will prevent too much blood loss from happening while the clot is being formed.